Thank you to Jane and Bill for communicating passion, uh, reasonable passion. And I found that uh, immensely refreshing. Because sometimes if you've been involved in this subject for a very long time, and you see the ebb and flow of popular interest, um, it can be uh, rather wary. And uh, being the chairman of something in England we call Shrink the Footprint, where we've been attempting to change the lifestyle of our church uh, for many years now, sometimes it can be rather discouraging um, how little progress seems to be made. But I really found uh, Jane and Bill's contribution immensely personally encouraging. And so many things came out of it. I mean, I just got uh, a moment to say one or two. Dominion, very important question. But of course, um, in chapter two, uh, the rules of uh, how we are to behave, the maker's instructions are given very clearly. Uh, it actually says that human beings are put here to till and to keep, to balance development and conservation. So it's not a primitive notion of return. Uh, there is uh, a very important balance to be observed there. Uh, and that's uh, something that hasn't been uh, emphasized as much as it ought to have been in the past. Spiritual life uh, develops and flows when we place the center of our interest and our love beyond ourselves. That is the birth of spiritual life, when we can uh, confide our love uh, to the other to work beyond ourselves. As Jesus Christ says, if you hoard up your life and hang on to it, you will shrink. But if you can give yourself away, give your life away, and address the other, uh, you'll know life in all its fullness. And I was very moved by uh, Jane's encounter at Cambridge uh, for her doctoral studies and uh, her submission to the magazine Nature, where, of course, what was really at issue was a style of communication subject to object. And what we are all trying to enter is a subject to subject communication, which is extraordinarily enlivening and fruitful. And that, of course, for want of that subject to subject communication, um, many of the evils in the world flow. Now, I have much to say about all that, but you cannot bear it now. Um, but perhaps it will come out in conversation a little later. And I wanted to turn to the mystery uh, that Costas Caras uh, has alluded to, the mystery that Bill McKibben has been uh, looking at. Uh, it seems so clear that uh, we are heading for um, a major crisis, which will fall most heavily, of course, and first of all, on the poor and those least able to adapt to it. How is it uh, that we are still sleepwalking? In his essay, Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren, written in 1930, John Maynard Keynes, the economist, predicted two things. He predicted a four to eight-fold increase in the standard of living, which, as he said, would put the economic problem within sight of solution. In consequence, he said, we should be able to satisfy our needs without having to work more than three hours a day. And the possibility was that we would learn to use our extra leisure to live, and I quote him, wisely, agreeably, and well. His first prediction was astonishingly accurate. Back there in 1930, uh, he predicted this increase and per capita economic growth averages about 400% across rich countries since he made the forecast. But I think that probably all of us in this room are witnesses to the unfulfillment of the second part of his prophecy. And the reason for this is discussed in a, a significant book to be published later this month, the authors Robert Skidelsky, the economic historian, and his son Edward, who's a philosopher, argue that the problem of the non-fulfillment of Keynes's second promise, prophecy is material insatiability. The incessant quest for more and more higher incomes, faster growth, is robbing us of the good life 
rather than helping us to obtain it. This is the mystery. The success of the first prophecy, however, contributed to uh, enormous energy uh, going into the old narrative, which saw happiness as a byproduct of a project of growth without limit, with no end in view beyond the process itself. And the vastly increased wealth in the world has, of course, lifted millions out of demeaning poverty and shouldn't be despised. There's still a very great deal to do in liberating the poor of the world from toil and scarcity. And a large part of the complexity of the theme we're discussing of global responsibility and environmental sustainability flows from the need to balance overconsumption in one part of the world with chronic poverty in other parts. But we've reached a point where in the over-consuming part of the world, where the excessive focus on more and more has numbed our awareness, because you can't get very far simply by um, invoking great generalizations and universals and values. You discover very quickly that that does not generate one iota of the energy that is necessary for transformation. And our awareness of what else beyond material satisfaction is necessary for us to lead valuable lives has been numbed. The Faustian impatience for the world as it is has led to a passion for material development which has obscured the other aspects of balanced human development. And this monocular left side of the brain view has been projected onto the environment and every day fresh evidence accumulates uh, that we need to rebalance our relationship with our planetary home. The theological task, because here I think that uh, people of faith have to approach all these questions with a proper humility. Actually, I think scientists have been remarkably successful in developing a global conversation um, and uh, making connections which are immensely fruitful. I don't think the representatives of the world's wisdom traditions have exactly covered themselves with glory in their rather fumbling attempts, with the exception of the notable exception of people like uh, the ecumenical patriarch, to develop the kind of global conversation that's necessary. The theological task used to be confined to elaborating the internal consistency of a particular religious narrative in an effort to secure the cohesion of one particular religious coalition. And in the process of doing this, a truce was declared very often with science on the basis of mutual irrelevance, quite systematically. Now it seems to me we're being called again to accept the truth, there's just one reality to resist reductionism and the limitation of truth to those propositions which can be demonstrated because they're quantifiable, because that old approach has led to a vast spiritual impoverishment and an opportunity for cults of unreason to colonize the resulting vacuum. It's time to recast our religious narratives and traditions in terms of one human race and one whole world. Uh, I think we have to recognize, however, the depth and the strength of the shift in awareness and perception uh, which has characterized uh, the Western world, which has led to the developments we've heard so eloquently described by uh, Jane and Bill McKibben. The 16th century French philosopher Charles de Beauvel express the matter with that brutal clarity which is often available at the beginning of some great movement of thought but gets rather muddier afterwards. And in his book, De Sapienti, he pictures a human being as no longer part of the universe but as its eye and mirror and indeed as a mirror that does not receive the images of things from outside but that rather forms or shapes them in himself. And it follows that as such a being looks out on the world around him, he sees not an animated nature in which he is a participant. And that, of course, is the picture given in the book of Genesis and by Charles Darwin. They are both agreed that we are creatures of the dust, stardust in fact. Adam means the creature of dust. 
that we are participants in an animated universe, uh, but uh, with this way of looking, subject to object, we see a world that is simply matter to be exploited in a theater of human willing. And we come to conceive of ourselves in the words of uh, Descartes, as maître possesseur de la terre, masters and possessors of the earth. And dominance is substituted for connectedness in the relationship between the human being and the universe of which he's a part. And the cost has been enormous. Somebody's already referred to the Prometheus myth. Um, in an ancient vase painting, Prometheus is shown with a pillar thrust through his vitals. And uh, he is, uh, uh, he's, oppressed by a great eagle, perhaps uh, uh, representing the avid world of thought, the pex that is the seat of his intuitive life, his emotional life. That grows back again, the liver grows back again under cover of darkness, that it is a terrible image of how weak the intuitive, the symbolic is in the daylight world which we've constructed for ourselves. But I do think it's, it's a moment of considerable opportunity. I think some of the ancient disciplines and festivals of the world's wisdom traditions have much to offer in opening up the awareness. And uh, a great deal has already been said about uh, Eucharist, and uh, I wish I could go into some other themes. But one thing perhaps hasn't been said, which is something that we've adopted as a family, and I think it's had an enormous uh, uh, effect on our consciousness, and that is a recovery of the idea of Sabbath. Talk about refraining. Uh, the idea of Sabbath, acting it out, central to Judaism, of course, rich in ecological significance, not least because it points beyond purely anthropocentric interpretations of creation. Genesis, again, emphasizes that creation reaches its crown and consummation not in the creation of humankind on the sixth day, but in the peace of the Sabbath on the seventh day. And that peace is more, of course, than the absence of violent conflict. It's a state of well-being and human flourishing, which includes, but is not exhausted by, material uh, prosperity. I think that to embrace once again in one's week, in one's year, a sense of rhythm, balance, lying fallow, refraining, a festival enough of enoughness, of relationships, brings us to a state which was beautifully described as one of the great teachers of the spiritual life in the Western tradition, Thomas Merton. He says that this peace which is created is the sanity and poise of a being that no longer has to look at itself because it is carried away by the perfection of freedom that is within it. Now this is an extraordinary revolutionary state to be in. It's a transforming state. Um, I have much to uh, say about uh, hubris and the Rio conference and uh, 1992 when a famous American historian wrote a book entitled The End of History as if we'd reached its consummation. Unfortunately, events subsequently suggest that uh, that's not the case. But you cannot bear all that now, and uh, <laughs> I think that uh, I will cease. Thank you very much. Today we are talking about the human beings and the relation of the human beings with the environmental problems. For me, the root of the environmental problems are the human beings. Human beings has, are having a character that we do not want to listen to the warnings, we do not want to listen to the statements made. We want to experience the disasters, we want to face them rather than taking the preventive actions ahead of time. For years and years, everybody in the field of environment has told that we are running short of the natural resources. We will be having the climate change. Nobody listened to, maybe nobody believed it. But when the time comes that we are running short of the fu uh, fuels, short of the natural resources, and 
feeling the hot weather, then everybody started to scream and looked for the preventive actions and take the necessary precautions. So, that's it. Okay, I'm going to shift into another subject. When the disaster comes, we, we are talking about the necessary actions to be taken. And we are in the mood of criticizing others. Decision makers, governments, municipalities. But we never criticize ourselves. We never ask ourselves, what am I doing for the environment? How my activities, actions affect, good or bad, the environment? So we also are ready all the time to blame the others. Let me ask you something. We had a very good lunch. Did you have a good time eating at your lunch today? Yes. yes. Did you have difficulty in uh, choosing your food and eating your food? No. No. What I did before the lunch time, I went downstairs and asked the waiters kindly to turn off the, some of the lights. We are talking about the shortage of the energy. Why are we wasting energy? So they turned them off. We were still very comfortable in eating lunch. Also in this room, we are from the beginning of the, today, we are having all these lights on. Do we need them? So before looking for the alternative sources of energy, the first principle should be we should save the natural resources. We should save the electricity and other energies. And then look for the alternative sources for them. May I ask the gentleman to just turn on the off half of the electricity? Lütfen yarısını söndürür müsünüz? Are we comfortable? Even the, we, we, we can continue our lectures with this. Uh, are there anybody who are not very happy with this lightning? Let there be darkness. <laughs> <laughs> so, that is the reason. What I try to convey to you, rather than speaking, let's integrate into our life, into our action, what we are suggesting. So it should not be a side activity of my life. It should be integrated into my life altogether. It should be integrated, become my lifestyle. I think somebody is... If, we can, if your point has been made... Yes, yes they can turn it on. <laughs> okay. Uh, because we're feeling... Because they can't see the film. Okay, it's <laughs> that they need for the... I don't know, for the, you know, pictures to be taken. So, but this is the message I want to give. We have to integrate our statements. We are sincere, we are not liars, but we have to adapt it. How we can adapt it, not only ourselves, to our neighborhood? By training, by education. By education, I do not mean the diploma education. By education, I do not mean the professional education, but public awareness about environmental issues and public environmental sensitivity generation. Okay, now we are talking about the climate change, greenhouse gases. What happened? Why we are having the climate change? It has started to become a disaster after the industrialization period. We just, most of the countries completed their industrialization period. Now there are some other uh, countries wants to get industrialized and strengthen their economic uh, levels, but we are facing the disaster of climate change. So what we say? We say industrialized, economically developed countries, we tell them, please do not get industrialized because we are having the environmental disasters. Okay? How, do are, they, uh, how are they going to supply their needs? Don't worry, I'm going to give them to you. So it is a kind of the opposite of NIMBY syndrome, not in my backyard syndrome, opposite. I got industrialized, but
but please don't get. I will give whatever you need. Is it ethical? I'm not saying it is ethical or not. I'm just asking you questions and give the, uh, leave the results to you. Okay, let's move into another subject. When we have industrialization to be discussed, should they get industrialized or not? If we let them, for example, the countries like India and China are in the progress of getting industrialized a lot. We cannot tell them not to get industrialized. But if they do not get the necessary precautions, we will be facing real, real, real worse disasters. So what we call that sustainable development. Okay, what is the role of the developed countries? The role of the developed countries, they should supply the know-how rather than selling the out of outdated technologies, just give them the latest technologies. And also those countries should just get the necessary preventive actions. So sustainable development should be carried out for the benefit of all human beings. When I am saying the human beings, Okay, the most important thing, not only during the generation of energy, during the production of the or manufacturing of the products, but also when we generate wastes, they are going to be disposed one way or another. We can incinerate them or we can landfill them. In most of the developing countries, we use landfilling because the initial investment and the operational cost is much more cheaper and easier. But if we do not get the necessary preventive actions, the methane gas and the carbon dioxide gas emitted will cause the climate change. Okay, so the first principle should be generate less waste. The second is reuse the waste generated. By reusing this, we are postponing the generation of the greenhouse gases. Then the third uh, hierarchy is the recycle gap. By recycling, we are preventing the generation of the greenhouses. Also, we are preserving the natural resources. The final point is either incinerate to gain energy, convert it to energy, or landfill it. But there is one more thing, especially for the economically developing countries, they cannot incinerate their wastes very, very quickly. Because most of the wastes, the composition when we check it, we see that 50% is the food products, food wastes. So they do not have high calorific value to incinerate and obtain uh, what we call energy. So they landfill it. But in that sense, rather than landfilling, we just tell them to convert those organic materials into the composting. By composting, we just replace the chemical fertilizers. We have the soil conditioner. The texture of the soil is improved, and we prevent the uh, generation of carbon dioxide and methane gas. Okay, I am just going to move. I had, I think, I have two and a half minutes, and uh, into another subject. We said that the, from the older times, human beings wants to dominate the others on the planet. If you look at the back, in reality, in the history, they say even the great philosopher Aristotle says that everything on the planet is for the good of the human beings. But I would uh, draw your attention to something. When they say the human beings, they only consider male groups, not female. For them, female, animals, plants, all the living creatures, including animals and the, uh, women and the slaves, are second class. Even in today, some parts of the world, women are tried to be treated 
as the second class citizens. When the situation is like that, if I cannot protect my rights, if I can't defend my rights, how can I protect the environment and the other creatures on the environment? And in reality, everything on the planet, plants, animals, everything, has the same right as me to survive and get the benefits of this planet. Okay, let me ask you, sometimes we, our actions does not coincide with our ideas. How many of you, let me see the hands, have uh, pets in their houses, dogs, cats, uh, birds? Okay. So do you think that, do we have the right to take those pets from their natural habitat, <coughs> put them into our warm houses, give them a good food, it is a good day, we just prepare very good conditions to them. But how do you feel that? Do you have that right to make those decisions for them? We are not trying to give them a bad life. We are not trying to make the life bad for them. We are trying to give a good atmosphere to them. But, you know, again, unconsciously we are trying to dominate. So let's just think about it and integrate our statements, our thought, with our actions. Thank you first to, of course, the Greek Orthodox Church and to uh, the Patriarch Bartholomew's uh, to, oh, sorry. Is that better? Um, good, okay. Thank you also to Southern Hampshire University uh, for inviting us. And thanks to all of you. I probably have read the works of about half of you and. I'm, I'm a huge fan of most of you, and those that I don't know already, uh, I will learn about soon. And I thank you for inviting me to speak. I think among you I'm probably the least experienced, and so I am embarrassed to offer you uh, very, I, I don't know that I can offer you a whole lot, except, of course, the subject that I work on, which is corporations. I work for an organization called CorpWatch, and at CorpWatch what we do is we focus on corporate malfeasance. We focus on the human rights abuses, environmental abuse, and fraud and corruption uh, by multinational corporations. And it is to that subject that I want to speak in responding to Bill McGibbon. Um, in his talk, he mentioned a couple of examples. He mentioned Bangladesh, which is very close to my heart because I'm half Bengali and I grew up on the other side of the border. And I worked at the Sisters of uh, Missionaries of Charity. So I saw the kinds of situations that he spoke of, and, and I grew up Catholic, so I know a bit about the book of Job. And I have to admit that throughout my life I've asked that question, why them, or for that matter, why me? Why are we being punished? And in his talk, uh, uh, Bill actually mentioned some of the answers, and you already know those answers. They are, in fact, the fossil fuel industry. There are companies like Exxon and Shell. We know where the problem is. As he said, you know, they have more money than God now which is, I, I'm sure it's true. I mean, they, maybe Steve Jobs may have a little more, but, or, or, or rather Apple. Um, but I wanted to, I, I wanted to, I, I wanted to refer to actually a, a writer that was referred to earlier today that you might know of, John Steinbeck. And he wrote a book many years ago, I think in, um, in, the, in 1939, The uh, Grapes of Wrath, or Grapes of Wrath. And in that, he described the story of this family, Tom Joad and his trip from Oklahoma, from the Depression, from the Dust Bowl to the promised land of California. But before he set out on this traditional Hollywood story of, of, of the hero's return, he encountered a series of difficulties. And his first challenge was, in fact, the fact that he was being thrown off his land, and them of the, of the other Okies, the other people from Oklahoma. And there is a vignette in that, I don't know if you remember this, where a man comes to the tractor to throw the people off the land. And, 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 the, and the farmers say, wait a second, you have to stop. You have to let, give us another month to pay our debts, to pay our mortgages. And, and in fact, I think, if I remember this right, I read it a long time ago. He says, you know, I went to school with you. You know, you're my, I'm paraphrasing here, you're my brother. You have to be able to help me. And, and, the, and, the, and the man in the tractor says, no, I cannot do that. And I want to read a passage. I managed to track it down on the internet. The men on the tractor say, it's not me. There's nothing I can do. I'll lose my job if I don't do it. And look, suppose you kill me, because they come after him with guns. They'll just hang you, but, you, but, before, but long before you're hung, 
There'll be another guy in the tractor and he'll bump your house down. You're not killing the right guy. That's so, the tenant said. Who gave you orders? I'll go after him. I'll kill him. He's the one to kill. You're wrong, came the man in the tractor. He got his orders from the bank. The bank told him, clear those people out or it's your job. So then the, the farmer says, the tenant farmer says, well, there's the president of the bank. There's a board of directors. I'll pull up the magazine and the rifle and I'll go after the bank. Um, and then the man in the tractor says something that I thought was immensely profound and I've remembered. He says, it's not us. It's the bank. The bank isn't like a man or an owner with 50,000 acres. He isn't like a man either. That's the monster. We're sorry, it's not us. It's the modest monster. Sorry, I'm repeating myself. And, and the farmer responds, but, but, of course, but the, the bank has just made a man. And he says, no, you're wrong. You're quite wrong there. The, the bank does something else than, the bank is something else than men. It happens, and of course, you know, this is the 30s, so they refer to men, not women. Um, um, and he says, it happens a bit, every man in a bank hates what the bank does, and yet the bank does it. The bank is something more than men. It's the monster. Men made it, and men can't control it. So, in responding to, uh, to Bill, uh, I, I want you to talk about the nature of the corporation. We have present among us many theologians who've studied, studied God, who've studied the Holy Spirit, who've studied the soul of man. We have biologists who've studied everything from the amoeba to chimpanzees to, 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 uh, to man himself and herself. But what we don't have, and even though we have economists among us, we have not understood the soul of this monster. And my question to you, my challenge to you, will be today that we have to understand this monster. Because unless we understand this monster, it will consume us. And we cannot, I mean, I could turn to my colleague who will speak after me and say, you work for Dow Chemical, Dow Chemical is the monster, you must be evil. But in fact, it is not Anna, it is not the individuals. And I think I would, there have been a lot of people today who have said, we must look inside ourselves, we have to change the way we, we're doing things, we must train the next generation. And I do agree, we have to do all of that. But there is a power that is much more powerful than all of us. And that is something, and in fact, with 350.org, they have tried to challenge that. And I want to tell you a little story from 20 years ago, well, actually 21 years ago exactly. I was at uh, the UN, and I was a reporter, and I was writing about this new summit, the UN Conference on Environment and Development, which you well know is the Rio Summit. And there were four speakers who spoke about the need for a climate change convention. So when they spoke, and I was the only reporter in the room, these four men, I think they were all men, spoke, and I wrote down, and I realized that one of them was a, Congress, was, was a member of Congress. So I was very excited, I called up my, my magazine, and I said, this is New Scientist in London, I said, you know what? There's a member of Congress, and he's calling for a treaty on climate change. We must print this. And they said, who is this, who is this Congress person? And I said, well, his name, and I looked it up, he said, it's Al Gore. And they said, oh, Al Gore, we've heard him before. Same story, you know. It's not going to change the world. This is, of course, 1991. And at the Earth Summit, I went to the Earth Summit, I later wrote a book. Um, when I was coming out to the, the, the principal, the main hall, I ran into Al Gore, and I said, Mr. Gore, I had my microphone with him, we recorded it. And I said, Mr. Gore, what are we going to have to do to, ch to save the planet? He says, these baby steps are not enough. We're going to have to take much bigger steps. Well, as you well know, uh, this is 1992, 1992, so I forget my history, but a couple of years later, he became the Vice President of the United States. Eight years of the Clinton-Gore uh, uh, um, presidency, and we did not see the change that we needed to make. We didn't see the challenge to the corporations. We didn't see the change that we needed to happen, and in fact, what Bill often refers to when he talks about 350.org, he's, he's talking about the tar sands pipeline. We've gone from a technology that we knew was bad to a worse technology. There's a professor, I think his name is Michael Clare, from New Hampshire. I think he's from New Hampshire, is, is that right? Hampshire College. Hampshire College, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And he speaks of extreme energy. If we were thinking, back then people said that, the, you know, we were, we were really in trouble. If today, if then we thought we were in trouble, we are in so much more trouble today when we have, I, I'm not a scientist, I don't remember the numbers, but I remember looking at five years later, 10 years later, at the levels that we had to control carbon dioxide emissions. And I noticed that every single time we surpassed them, by far. So today, if we're going beyond that, and we're fracking, 
you know, for shale in North Dakota, and we're, we're destroying mountaintops in Kentucky and, 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 and drilling in England and Bulgaria, we're in a lot of trouble. Well, who is doing that? It's not just us. It's not us as individuals. It's not the Bangladeshis. It is the corporation. It is that entity that we have created. And I want to return a little to what uh, Jane Goodall just said this morning. What separates us from the chimpanzee? The fact that we can speak, that I can give you a talk, that you can listen, we can have symposia. We also have the ability to plan, and we can plan events down the road. We can, let's say, for example, where people often you know, say, well, if, if we were to put, um, animals have no sense, and let's say, for example, if I were to build, let's say, an artwork of a house of bananas, and we let loose, I'm not a primatologist, so I'm probably, probably, this is probably a bad idea, but if we let loose a group of monkeys and eat all the bananas, and nothing will be left. And this is the idea that we're left with um, when we learn about the tragedy of the commons. If we let loose animals and people, they're not going to regulate themselves. Well, I think there's actually a lot more than just us or chimpanzees that's the problem. The problem is that soul of that monster that I'm going to return to again and again. And I think it's up to us. You know, we, we can, Al Gore wasn't able to do it. President Obama, when he became president, you know, said he was going to change things. But in fact, he just, you know, licensed oil drilling uh, in, the, in the Arctic. Uh, he is now, in fact, going back on human rights in Nigeria. His government has actually uh, uh, just, I think, last week, you know, uh, uh, sided with Shell in, in, uh, uh, against the people of Nigeria who have been fighting against the, the murder of Ken Sarawiwa and his, and his friends. So what is it that we're going to have to do? I'm, I'm running out of time now. So um, I, I, want to, I want to leave with, uh, with a thought because uh, uh, the Bishop of London mentioned the book, uh, The End of History, and if I remember it, I, I didn't read it. But he talked, as I, as I recall, the end of history was about how since war was ended, we would now live, is this roughly correct? We would now live you know, in a very different society. And then, of course, came the end of nature, uh, which Bill McGibbon wrote. Well, I think we're, we're actually, please don't steal this from me, by the way, because this, this is my plan for my, ne not my next book, but the one after. I think what we're, what we're facing now is the end of democracy. And it's because even though we live in a global world and we're able to travel where we want if we have the money, we are actually ceding power to the monster. And the monster isn't the people at Dow or the people at Halliburton, it is the corporation itself. And so my plea to you as scientists, as journalists, as, as theologians, is to examine this monster. We can march, as Bill did, and we can hold hands around the White House, but we're going to have to go a lot deeper. Our study has only just begun if we really want to transform the planet. It is uh, an incredible privilege to be here. Um, I was a kid growing up in Wyoming, learning and watching Jane Goodall's work. And then I get an invitation from His All Holiness to come and speak in front of an incredible collection of people and their expertise. So this morning, folks were wondering what's happened to wonder and shock and awe. And I guarantee you I have found it. <laughs> because I, I really can't imagine um, what, what I'm going to offer to you uh, that is going to be that insightful, quite frankly. So it's also with humility and humbleness that I offer these comments. And I think those are two words we could use a lot more of, quite frankly. Jane this morning um, talked, and I hope I have her quote roughly right, the more answers we get, the more mysteries remain. And I would challenge any of us here today who are trained as scientists, and I would put the social scientists in that same category, to recognize how true that is. The more we seem to unravel, the more we realize we haven't really understood much of anything at all. And it's a little bit frightening when you then talk about the complexity of the problems that we're trying to address. And the other thing I'd like you to keep in mind as I talk is Jonathan's comment again from this morning. So you can see I've, uh, I think this is the third version of my comments today. <laughs> There are limitations to what science
can address. Science cannot address the why. And the why is very, very important. So our session is energy and climate change. Um, it's proven to be unbelievably complex. I, I think the, the limitations of the Kyoto Protocol, the total unraveling of discourse at the UN starting probably in Copenhagen perhaps before, certainly highlights how complicated that is. But I will tell you as an organic chemist who used to try and make a process better, or somebody who now has a life cycle assessment group that reports under them, the biggest problem is that climate change and energy are just a small piece of what we need to understand and unravel. Energy and water, for example, are connected. 19% of the electricity in California is used to pump and treat water. According to the National Renewable Energy Lab in the United States, 39% of all freshwater withdrawals are used in the production of electricity. You, you can't start treating these all as independent problems that we go work on. They're too interconnected. We are now cycling more and more and more, or we're asking nature to cycle more and more nitrogen and phosphorus. And things just start to get worse. And the more we unravel the feedback loops, um, the more challenged, I guess, and the more humbled we are about what we're trying to do. So as scientists, we like to define measures, if we could measure it, right? In, in business, one of the, the, the sayings is what gets measured gets managed. We build models, and of course you'll probably know the quote about models. All models are wrong, but some are useful. We refine them, but ultimately they're very uncertain. We find them to be inadequate. Again, as a chemist who had to make choices in the lab, this solvent versus that one, this reagent versus that, these conditions versus an alternative, you find yourself faced with a lot of trade-offs. You rarely find something that's better on all those dimensions that you're trying to look across. And one of my favorite depictions of this was in a life cycle assessment conference, and they said, you know, everybody wants to add all this up and we'll just come up with a number, and that will guide our choices and tell us what we ought to do, what alternative we ought to pick. And it's a bit like going where I grew up. Any town that you drove up to would have a sign, said population, 3,129, elevation, 5,662 feet, established 1888, which adds up, for those of you who are fast in your head, to 10,579. And that's how we would start making choices. Which product is better? Which technology is better? And obviously, it's silly. It's ridiculous. But this is what you see the public <coughs> demanding, that we put labels on products so that people just know what's the better one to choose. It's as if we can add up water impact against greenhouse gases against biodiversity and somehow come up with a number that tells us what we ought to do. But it's not that simple. And for a lot of things, you simply just don't have measures. So with all due apologies to Einstein and those of you who love this quote, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase it because I was not online. Unfortunately, not all things that can be measured count. And not all things that count can be measured. We're ultimately talking about values. What's important to us? And one of the challenges is that what's important to me maybe is not necessarily the same thing that's important to you. I've had uh, the incredible privilege and opportunity the last two years to be living in Switzerland. Same family actually living in almost the same amount of space, which is perhaps a bit disheartening. We generate about one-third the garbage that we used to in the United States any given week. I actually can recycle, mechanically recycle less, so that's pretty astounding. 
We have one car. I can pretty much guarantee you, if we had been living in Midland, Michigan, we would be the owners of three cars right now with an 18-year-old daughter. So what is it that as allows us to live every bit as well, I would argue better, than we did in the United States? The Swiss, my humble opinion, as a culture, have set about to articulate their values. What is important to them? What is important to them as a country, as a society, as a culture? And then how do we set up institutions, structures, requirements, rules, incentives? It's very expensive to throw something away in Switzerland, and it's very expensive to buy it in the first place. So they've set up this coherent set of structure and signals that ultimately gets us to make the personal choices, the business choices, that they as a culture want reflected. So I would submit that actually that's our challenge. How do we do that? How do we collectively take all of our thinking, our experiences, our understandings, our traditions, our beliefs, our expertise, our training, and create a dialogue, feed a dialogue that's respectful, that's inclusive, that's generous, that's gracious, that drives accountability for us as individuals, as citizens, as children of God. And I would disagree, actually, that it's not the corporation. The corporation exists in a framework that we, as professionals, as citizens, as children of God, have set up. And we, as professionals, as citizens, as children of God, can change that. But it takes a collective will, a collective respect, tolerance to do that. <coughs> I've had uh, the great privilege to help the company define our sustainable chemistry program. And one of the things that has been very humbling as you go about that is to realize that a company which is known for a certain amount of arrogance is figuring out that we don't have the expertise we need, we don't have the perspectives that we need, we indeed have a piece of a jigsaw puzzle. And it's only when each of us is willing to bring our piece, because we all hold a piece, and come and put it on the table, that we collectively are going to be able to put together this picture, that we will piece together where we really need to go. The thing that I fear most is the pace with which that happens. Because as Bill said earlier, we are rapidly running out of time. We were running out of time in the 1970s. So I will close there. It has been a great honor to listen to the dialogue. And I hope indeed, and I know that organizers are working very hard on this, that this is the start of a dialogue not the end of the dialogue. Thank you. But for just a few minutes, are, are there ways in which you'd like to re react, respond to each other, ask any questions of each other? Uh, I have the last word, so I'm okay. <laughs> yeah. um, there's a mic there. No? Yes? Um, um, sure. sure. Um, uh, back in 1992, uh, Greenpeace put out a book uh, called the uh, Greenpeace Book of Greenwash. And that's actually the genesis of Corkwatch, where I work. It's very easy uh, uh, to put out an image, as, as Bill mentioned, like British Petroleum, and say, uh, we are going to go beyond petroleum. 
But as we know now, 10 years, I think, after the, the original slogan was coined, the companies actually scotched that slogan. They know it's not true. They know at the heart of, of their business, of their uh, being, is the person to profit. And we do have to remember that. I think we're going to have to reconceive our relationship with the Earth and the corporation, the global corporation, is not going to be part of that when it's centered on profit. But I don't think that idea of globalization where, we, we, where solutions are offered by global institutions is actually going to solve them. We're going to so solve these locally. We're going to solve them in much simpler ways uh, than a global uh, institution like now. And uh, I think uh, um, uh, Professor Ashford mentioned that perhaps companies can give um, penance for their, uh, for their uh, sins. Well, I would ask that of Dow, because as you know, Dow owns a company called Indian Carbide. And when I turned 21, 30,000 people began the process of dying because of a, a chemical called methyl isocyanate that, uh, in a factory in Bhopal. And to this day, Dow owns uh, Union Carbide, and they have neither apologized nor Fix the lives of those 30,000, the families of those 30,000 people have died and more. Um, so, you know, it's not just the quote, it's not just saying sorry, it's actually doing something very different. And I question if the corporation has that in its heart. You have also noted that Anne does not represent oh, the Dow. <laughs> Sure. Okay. Uh, we were talking about uh, putting a tax on the carbon emission or making some penalties for the emission of carbon. What I'm thinking, what if a rich country or a rich company says, okay, I'm going to give the money, all the penalties, all the taxes, and I emit as much as I want. Do we want to accept this? Does it serve to our mission? I would like to have some uh, comments about it from the floor. Thank you. 